Thank you all for joining me before i begin i need to pray father god i just come boldly before your throne of grace and i lift your name unto you thank you so much for being a part of my life thank you for guiding me thank you for leading me i pray that you lead me in this discussion let me discuss everything that you have revealed to me so that i can share it with your children god please allow them to retain the information and apply what they need to apply in their lives so that we can all be empowered, God. Please um, and, uh, quicken your Holy Spirit inside of me so that I can be obedient, Lord. And please direct my path and lead me. Most importantly, God, please let your will be done, not, not ours, but yours. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is still in your blood. Amen. All right, so thank you all so much for joining me on Laws, Life, and Health. Let's talk about it. Um, so today, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit nervous because I'm on YouTube Live right now. So if you wanted to go and check live, you can. Um, this is my first video going live. And I think I somewhat did it incorrectly because I should have started at 17, but I actually started the visual um video at 7 p.m so i wanted to continue um off where i started yesterday where i left off yesterday so what i was talking about was um let's see specifically so i was talking about how um Pluralism and paternalism have impacted uh, different communities. And also I had discussed, you know, um, different perspectives of how we feel about certain things. Like when we think about racism, racism is something that most people try to avoid, right? But it's still prevalent in society. So I had only really scratched the surface yesterday with what I was discussing when I said, well, what do you think about the word nigger? What do you think about the word white nigger? What do you think about the word orange nigger? It wasn't to discuss something to sort of um, empower racism. What I am trying to get everyone to see and realize is that what's really important is how we as a country 
are able to discuss the issues that are impacting this country. If we don't identify the issues that are causing these disparities in our communities with behavior norms that are inconsistent and, and create inequality for people, how can we prevail as a country? So we want to be able to at least scratch the surface on certain topics and be able to discuss them without offense. Because being offended, it only leads to isolation. And isolation leads to the issue not being resolved. So in order to be able to combat um, social issues on a lot of different ways, we have to first analyze the behaviors that are co directly correlated with these sorts of issues. So racism is a behavior norm. People that participate in acts of racism, they are, it's, it spreads, it's a disease. And so it should be addressed. So that wasn't the only thing that I was discussing. I was also talking about the different things that overpower people. So what I wanted to get in, um, what I wanted to really focus on today is um, how it, okay, so the, the Lord, got, okay, so God had revealed something to me yesterday when I had got off the phone. Okay, so what I was discussing specifically was the International Labor, Labor Organization. Basically, they are saying that the unemployment rate needs to increase in order for um, people, in order for individuals to be able to gain power over their pay. But how can this behavior norm actually be something that we need for our country? Because everyone wants to work, right? So it, it's very important to understand why are all of these things happening the way that they are? Well, this is the way that God is purifying his body, the church. So there are a lot of different ways that God purifies the, ch the church. And yesterday I was talking about if you draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. You can um, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is in James 4 and 8. So the difference between purification and sanctification is that purify is to cleanse something, to rid of it, to rid of the impurities, while sanctify is to make you holy. Okay. So we need to consecrate. We consecrate ourselves to set us apart for the things that God wants us for us. So we, we consecrate and set aside sacred things. And we can do that through fasting, prayer, um, group fasting individual fasting. So God wants us to be uh, spiritually, God wants to spiritually refine us. And in order to be spiritually refined, we need to think about others and not always think about ourselves. We should not just always think about our needs and desires. We should be thinking about the needs and desires of becoming freer of the things that we always want. So in order to become spiritually refined, we need to meditate and devote our natural, um, our natural refining to God. So God wants us to be purified, sanctified, and spiritually refined. So when we look at Mark 4, 19, it says, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and then becoming unfruitful. So we don't want, we don't want to be full of impurity. God looks at us as having the potential to be fully purified sanctified and spiritually refined 
So just because God sees us with potential, it does not mean that he's going to snap his fingers and, and get rid of all the problems in your life. We need to have a relationship with God. Now, establishing and maintaining a relationship with God will remove the impurities in our lives. And this will allow you to be purified by removing the uncleanness that has caused impurity. So what are some habits that causes impurity? Okay, so you have uh, you, people that get, have a lack of sleep. A lack of sleep causes impurity because when you're not rested and you're not getting a proper um, rest like you need, what happens is you wake up and you, you feel you have a lack of energy. You feel um, uh, overwhelmed. It could lead to you feeling overwhelmed. It could also lead to chronic depression or um, like anxiety. That's something that causes impurity. So lack of sleep, it, it just doesn't cause depression. It do just doesn't cause anxiety. A lack of sleep can cause a lot of different things. It could minimize your alertness, your awareness. So you want to be able to have enough sleep so that you could be rejuvenated. And focus on the actual goals that God has for you. So sometimes uh, impurity could also come from a lack of exercise. You know, um, many times you could actually you could actually exercise like sitting in your chair, or if you're laying down. You could be doing some leg exercises or just lifting your leg up and down, you know, or lifting your arms up and down. It allows you to um, exercise while you're uh, being still. So just having some form of exercise in your daily routine, maybe instead of taking the elevator, you take the stairs. So exercising actually does um, good for you and your brain, your, your entire body and your brain. So other things that causes um, impurity is a lack of focus or meditation. So how do you get a lack of focus or meditation? Well, when you are focused on everything Besides what you're supposed to be focused on. And I usually tell people, I say, well, you know, you just got a whole lot of nothing going on. Got a whole lot of going on, but a whole lot of nothing going on. So you don't want to, you know, spend so much of your time not doing something that is going to be beneficial to your life. Because God wants you to also be uh, a good steward. You should be punctual. You should be focused. You should be alert. You should have discernment. So if you think that God is just telling you to maybe um, travel across country and you, you end up doing it, you start your journey doing it, but God didn't tell you to do that. So now you got to go back and reconvene with God and pray and see if, that, if that's what, um, to confirm if that's what God really wanted you to do or not, because you just did it without seeking his approval. It's like we have to focus on the things that God wants for us, because when you're continuing to do the same thing over and over again, and you expecting something different to occur, it's not going to occur. So you have to fully commit yourself to the Lord. And when you fully commit yourself to the Lord, you are able to hear the voice of God and he will lead you. So you're not going to have a lack of focus. And if you're focusing, if you, if you are distracted 
you could get distracted from your focus. So if you're getting distracted, then that's when you need to go back and you need to meditate on the word of God and you need to pray again and you need to uh, seek God. Because it's important to make sure that prayer is a part of your lifestyle. It isn't something that you just do in the morning and at night. Prayer is a lifestyle. This is something that you incorporate in your, your lifestyle every single day in different activities. So you want to make sure that you are meditating on the word and focusing on the plans that God has for you. Now, another thing is technology through media outlets. Technology can have a real negative effect on your focus. And it could be time consuming. So they had actually did a study and the study has showed that people that um, are on uh, social media platforms and texting most of the time, it's, it's impairing their ability to use proper language. So now they are so accustomed to, um, I forget which study, I'm going to try to post it. Um, now, so now since they're accustomed to saying TMI or OMG, now they're lacking and improving on um, their vocabulary. So it's like, um, and when you're having dinner, everyone at the table is ha have their cell phone out on the cell phone. Like when crime is taking place, they they call this the uh, bystander effect. When when crime is taking place, and this is something that is very very serious, the bystander effect. I'm going to post that. Uh, the bystander effect is when other people assume that another person is going to intervene and help. So in the in, a, in in the mission of a crime, they're all standing by watching a crime take place. And no one is preventing that crime or intervening because they all assume that someone else is going to assist. So they have this, they had this in New York where they did a study where uh, um, it was a violent uh, crime taking place and they everybody just had their cameras out taking photos and video. So they assumed that the next person would help, which in fact, that person or anyone, no one else intervened. So it is important to be able to focus on the, your surroundings and what is happening what is happening around you and also there there is also addictions people have different addictions some people have addictions of exercising some people have addictions of eating too much some people have drug addictions opiate addictions alcohol and uh, marijuana addictions uh, they have all of these different addictions and that's consuming them it's consuming their lifestyle it's prohibiting you from being at your full self maximizing your full potential so god wants you to be at your full potential this is important to understand that because see god that's what that's what he sees he does not see us uh, as full of impurity. He sees us with full potential and he wants to spiritually refine us. So we have to say to that particular uh, addiction, whatever that may be, you have to say, okay, well, I have the Holy Spirit. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I will not allow this, this uh, addiction to take over my life. You are in control of you through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is leading you exactly to where you need to be. And what you should be participating in. 
So you have to remember that you have to be bold and fearless in this world. And in order to be bold and fearless, you can be that way, but you should have the take the Holy Spirit with you. Because the Holy Spirit gives you guidance. So here um, I'm going to turn to the Bible, uh, John 17, 13 through 26. Okay, I'm going to read this. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world anymore than I am of the world. My prayer is that you, my prayer is that you not, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them. By the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me. Because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. See, so what this is saying is, see, God wants us. To allow him to come into our life and in our hearts to sanctify us. He not just, he wants to purify us. So what is purification? Well, when you think about purification, you, you have to first think about internally. God is cleaning you from the inside out of all the things that will or have prohibited you. From being in the full purpose of that what God has for you. So your old life can't correlate with the, the new things that God has given you and who God has created you to be. There's no direct correlation. Because as you can see, you live in this world, but you are not a part of the world. You don't do ever the things that the world does. So when you have the Holy Spirit, it's basically like a, it's it, it's not going, the Holy Spirit is not going to allow you to continue to practice in certain things or acts and behaviors that have prohibited you from being in the full purpose of God. So that purification, God is cleansing you from the inside out. Because it comes, it starts from within. See the word of God says, it's not what you eat that defile it. Uh, 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 defile it you. It's what's in the heart, spoken out of the mouth that defiled them. So what, what's in your heart, it comes out of you. And you said, it, it all started with a thought. So you can't just say something out of your mouth if you didn't think it first unless you were just abruptly speaking. But even when you're abruptly speaking, you at least think about the one word or two when you're saying it. So God says that it's what's in your heart spoken out of your mouth and knows the file of person. So we have to understand that what, what you are, 
what what you are consuming the seeds that you are allowing to be planted into your heart and into your life are contaminating the person that you are they are either going to it's either contaminating you or it's allowing you to be an overcomer in life because everyone isn't contaminated right because when you're when you're consistently seeking the word of god and being led by the holy spirit of god you're not going to be con uh uh contaminated with negativity or negative things that is internally um pre preventing you from prevailing in god so those things are not going to be prevalent in your life because you have the holy spirit but when you are sitting back and you are like, oh, well, see, I don't want to talk about that because that is something that makes me uncomfortable. Well, it, it, it can make you uncomfortable, but it's still going on in society. A word in the dictionary is, you know, it still impacts the some of the minds and the perceptions of people and how they view this country. So, no, of course, the, the, the past is, you know, people are not going to be stuck in the past because if they're stuck in the past and living in the past, then how are they able to move forward or anything in their life? But in order to be able to provide conflict resolution, you have to identify problems that have prevented this country from moving forward. Once you identify problems, then you can provide conflict resolution. The um, evading conflict resolution is something that is um, what individuals do that have an avoidance personality. And they also could be suffering from other mental health issues as well. When you have a lack of accountability, um, avoidance, those things prohibit um Pro prohibit an individual from being successful in their relationship and their walk with God. So let's talk about some solutions. I'm wondering, did I even, did I skip over the, I don't know if I did or not. I'm trying to see. Okay. Yeah, I think I did. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is my, now, my pastor, well, he he was talking about some things on Sunday about, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So that's, that's another thing I forgot to go back to. Okay. So I'm, I want to go back. I'm going to revert back a little bit and, and go back to, um, what we were discussing with uh, sexist, okay? So yesterday I had uh, mentioned that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. And that's in uh, 1 Corinthians 11.3. And so when we look at the definition of sexist, it is prejudice or discrimination based on sex, especially discrimination against women behavior, conditions, or attitude that foster stereotypes of social roles based on sex. So that is what the definition of sex is, is. and I've given you the information um, about the order. See, there is an order that God has implemented for us. And that order is exactly what it says in 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 3. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So whatever pre-existing thoughts and belief systems that I had previously, if it's in contrary to the word of God, that's not something that I want to partake in anymore. Because, see, when you become vulnerable to God, you allow God to come into your heart and into your life and you don't you don't do things the same. There is nothing the same that you're going to continue to do. 
So if you believe that, you know, um, participating in acts that is consistent with sexual immorality goes against the principles of God. So why are you compromising your beliefs? See, you are going to only have one God. So if that if it's that sexual immorality that you have, what that's going to do is that's your that's your God that you re now replacing God with. So you choosing to behave, you choosing to perform in the act of whatever is in disobedience to God, and now you have made that your God. Whether you want to accept it or not, the truth is the truth. So we have to we have to understand that it is imperative for us to understand what is right and from what is wrong. It's not about who's right. It's not about who said it. It, it doesn't matter about who the messenger was. Who God used to give you the message. What matters is, are you taking heed to what God has said to you? Are you taking heed to the word of God and what, what God wants for you when it comes to you being obedient to him? Because whatever you value over your relationship with God, that is that has now become your new God. I mean, you, you don't have to accept that. God doesn't force you to accept anything. That's the good thing about God, and that's what I love the most, is the fact that he loves us so much that he allows us to choose to love him back. We get a chance to love God back. We're not forced to do it. We, we voluntarily do it because of his love for us. And not just because of his love for us, he's just generous. He, loves, he cares about everyone, even the people that have done him wrong. And so it's important. It's the scripture. The scripture says you should forgive your neighbor 70 times seven. And when I look at that scripture, it didn't say 70 times seven for different things. It didn't say 70 times seven for only if they did this one thing. So you can't pick and choose which one that they did. If, even if they did the same thing to you 70 times seven, we should forgive. That's the revelation that God gave to me. Even if it's for the same thing. And it's like, okay, well, God, see, this is not right. <laughs> they have sat here and did the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And God said, forgive them. Even if, 70 times seven. So you can you can understand that that's even if it's for the same thing. Because guess what God God was saying that when they're deceived they don't know. They don't know that they're deceived. He also said that it is not healthy people that need a doctor. But the sick. So if people are mentally sick, they're spiritually dead. How, who's going to revive them? God will revive them. They have life with the, Holy, with the Holy Spirit, with God being directed by God. They have life more abundantly. But if they don't choose life, they're spiritually dead. So what does God want for us? God wants us to love people and to that devil leave up out of them. We have to love them so much that the devil flee from them. And that's not something that um sound it doesn't sound like an easy task, right? But when you do that, you are allowing God to sanctify you. At the same time, you saying you're you're you you can actually view people for who they really are and see that they need help. And so the same mercy that God gives to you is the same mercy that you would give to them. Because you're like, oh, God, they really don't know. They really do not know how to be happy. 
they hear bad news and it's like, oh, the world has ended. It is not the end. Bad news isn't a permanent condition. It failure is not a permanent condition. You have to understand that God sees you to have potential. And what potential are you going to show God that you have? See, for me, it's, it's only like a few different ways you're going to go. You're going to go the route of doubt, unbelief that leads to defeat, or you're going to have faith, hope, and that leads to you being an overcomer. So you overcome things in life. You're an overcomer. So you hear some bad news like, oh, okay, well, you know, I know God's going to give me some solutions for that. Oh, yeah, I got laid off at work. But guess what? I have like 20 other jobs just email me. Because I, I, my, my faith was accompanied by works. See, faith without works is dead. You have to, uh, you have to, it's in the, it's, you have to get up and, and do what you need to do. Yes, God will open the windows of heaven over your life. But if you're just sitting back and you're just sitting in a corner all day, not even getting up to do anything for yourself, do you think God is going to make you a plate of food and feed it to you? You take initiative. You have accountability. You show that you are a person of good stewardship, that you're punctual. You can do this. You don't sit and just wait on things to be handed to you. Yes, God opens the door, but you got to get up and go and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm here. I'm available for this job. And then God will orchestrate things in your favor. God will orchestrate whatever it is that your goal is as long as it's in alignment with God. But see, you have to understand that God understands your heart fully. He knows your intent. You have to be intentional with God. And what do I mean by being intentional? You be intentional by making sure that you show God that he is important. He is the only option in your life. Because God, is, he's going to analyze that and he's going to know anyway. So it's important to understand that um, you are waiting on God. So let me go over a couple of things that I, my pastor, now he went over this um, on Sunday. And I really enjoyed it because I was sitting here and I was thinking about consumers and contributors. And I was also thinking about how people are always withdrawing from your life. They're withdrawing your energy. They withdrawing your encouragement. They withdraw your inspiration. They withdraw your money. They withdraw everything from you. They, they just want to take everything out of you. That God has given you. And they're not making any deposits in your life. See, they should be depositing encouragement to you. They should be depositing inspiration in your life. They should be depositing opportunity for you. They should be de depositing just uh, all sorts of things into your life. But if you find yourself only just being withdrawn from and your energy is so consumed that now you're like where is your focus don't allow other people to drain you to the point where they have withdrawn every single drop ounce of energy that god has given you because guess what god has given each and every one of us faith he has distributed faith to each and every one of us. So if they want to continue to withdraw that uh, everything out of you, you have to let them go and lead them in their beliefs and pray for them. Because otherwise, guess what? They consuming you. And then guess what you're going to end up doing? You're going to end up consuming somebody else. So don't do it. 
it's not good okay so i'm gonna go over this list of what he said and this is really nice so oh um i kind of skipped over ageism i'm gonna go back to that um uh, or maybe i could let's see okay so let me let me just go over ageism again okay i only i had briefly talked about it yesterday so um ageism it is a stereotype. So a stereotype is how we think, how you think. A prejudice is how you feel about something. And discrimination is how you act towards others or yourself. And this is based on age. So we know that discrimination is how you act and behave. Okay. Prejudice is how you feel about people. And stereotype is the way that you think. So when we think about the inter, um, intersectionality, okay, so intersectionality was um, was created by Kimberly Crenshaw back in like 1989. And so now many um, schools and uh, academia institutions, they are trying to adopt the intersectionality theory. And so what the intersectionality theory it does is it's just like a complex cumulative way in which um when you if you wanted to look at the lines of okay so you have discrimination here which is like the x and then you have racism sexism and all these other things which is like the y so it is what it does it, it finds and identify the x y axis of why something is occurring it it overlaps it, it has like a direct correlation. So if discrimination has happened in this area, it is it is it caused by B, racism, C, sexism, and such. And, and so it overlaps and identify the X and Y axis of why that um, complex form of discrimination or prejudice or racism is existing. And you don't necessarily have to do that with discrimination. It could also be uh, a lot of different things. Okay, so why are students not learning? It could could learning be caused by their dress code? So intersectionality approach, it'll find the X and Y axis of okay, students learning based off of how they how they uh they their dress attire. So is it dress attire and income? So the intersectionality is going to identify learning as an issue and dress attire and socioeconomic status or income level. So it's going to identify the X and Y axis of that particular issue or whatever that experience of the marginalized individual or group is, okay? So the idea is that it comes to thinking about how inequalities persist. Categories like gender, race, class are best understood as overlapping. So these are sort of like overlapping um, intersections of why this particular uh, issue is happening in this marginalized community or marginalized group of individuals. Okay. So that's what the intersectionality theory um, identifies. So a lot of different um, academia institution, institutions are adopting the um, intersectionality, intersectionality uh, theory. So let's look at this ageism and intersectionality. So there's an article that I found and um, you can go ahead and read it in your spare time. It's not really that long, okay? But to sum it up, the article discussed members of a larger group of older persons in their dual, dual roles as members of other vulnerable groups defined by like different dimensions of gender, disability, race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, et cetera, okay? Now, what the intersectionality applied was that hopefully people were helpful and that they did not receive any mixed impact of more than just uh, one or two dimensions. And so remember the dimension is 
either their sexual orientation, their socioeconomic status, their race and ethnicity, all of those sorts of things. And so what they found was that in this article, it, it showed that older women, um, it sh- uh, the article showed that even though older women, they have experiences of um, identity impact. However, the experience of older black women is more different than that of older white women. So, and what, what it means is that he or she, which depending on they, their gender status, he or she must live in a world in which systems and experiences of discrimination change over time. In order for the social and political context to change. So what this what this article showed was that 57% of black Americans believed that they were discriminated against with respect to equal pay or promotion. Versus 13% of white Americans and women were far more likely than men to report gender discrimination with respect to equal pay or promotion. So 41% women versus 18% men. So black women are discriminated against and they feel the discrimination as they age. Okay, so this is something that's really important to identify. You know, if we're not discussing these sorts of issues, how are we providing conflict resolution? So I have mentioned a while ago, I touched based on how in the United States Supreme Court, we have four individuals in the United States Supreme Court who are who were born in the 1930s. And so they're in their 90s. And so this was somewhat of an issue because the United States Supreme Court is one of the most powerful positions in the United States. And so we have the um, Age Discrimination Act of 1975, but it doesn't have an addendum attached to that Age Discrimination Act. So if you are, what I've suggested was that if you are in a position of power, you should be able to get a uh, physician's approval. Your physician is your medical doctor, a medical doctor, a physician that can approve you for work. Because if you have medication that is impairing your ability to have a clear and sound mind, then that means that you're putting the country at risk. So I'm not, I'm definitely not against the Age Discrimination Act of 1975. I think that the Age Discrimination Act of 1975, it tremendously helped American people. What I am saying and suggesting is this. There should be an addendum attached to the Age Discrimination Act of 1975, which says if your medical doctor or physician recommends that your medication can, in fact, impair your ability to have a clear and sound mind, then that person should be on leave. It should be no reason why you're passing bills, legislative bills that are impacting the lives of millions of people. And you're taking medication that can influence your decision. Why would that be okay? Or is that another question that is rubbing the wrong type of surface for discussion? See, because in order to enact conflict resolution, you have to first identify the problem. So that's an issue in this country. We have politicians who are you know, at, at, at the elderly level. And it is important to make sure 
that they are cleared maybe semi-annually or quarterly. Quarterly would be which every, every three, three months or every four months, depending on if you uh, accept three or four more months in, in a quarter. So if, if, it, if it goes by four months, that'll be th three times a year. If it goes by three months, it'll be four times a year, every three months, or semi-quarterly, which is every six months. And so it it's okay for us, once we identify the issue, we need to be able to provide some solution. And so that's one recommended solution, okay? So let me go ahead and I wanted to discuss, let's see. Okay, so I'm here now. All right. So it says now, when 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 I just went over all of that information and I had went over the, uh, well, I went over arrogance, pride, and overconfidence yesterday. And it clearly shows that arrogance, let me just, let me just read it. Um, let me just repeat this again. So arrogance as in superiority is an exaggerated sense of one's importance that shows itself in the making of excessive or unjustifiable claims, unjustified claims. So you just think you got it all figured out. Can nobody tell you nothing? Just arrogant. So pride. A reasonable or justifiable sense of one's worth or importance. Overconfident. Like I mentioned, I was very overconfident. I used to be. I used to be very, very overconfident. So this says excessively or unjustifiably confident. Having too much confidence as in one's ability or judgment. So we overcome these sorts of things because guess what? We allow God to lead us. Everything, all the glory goes to God. Everything that you've done in your life, if, if you're submitting your will to God, God, it gets all the glory, all for every single accomplishment. Because guess what? You wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for God creating you. So all the glory goes to God. So now when I go down, I wanted to talk about the pattern here. So do you see the pattern of one's own importance with the arrogance, pride, and overconfidence? So that, that is a pattern. So these type of patterns is what disallow you from having a strong relationship with God. And that's not something that you want. You want to have a very good relationship with God. But when you when you start taking credit for everything and you're not giving no credit to God, then now you're gonna have division. Now you're gonna have confusion. See, because but God is not a God of division. God is not a God of confusion. When you begin to have a good relationship with God, you you begin to understand the traits that God has. You understand who God is because you have been in a relationship, so you are understanding God's traits. So don't mistaken or don't misinterpret the goals of God that he has for your life. You want to remember to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's not about making all the important things in your life something that you did on your own. Why is that a necessity for you to do that? Why is it a requirement? Why is it a prerequisite for you to be accepted by other people? Just get the glory to God. God, you did it. You opening up, you opened up all these doors for me to excel and to succeed in my life. And I appreciate it. Thank you, God. I wouldn't have the knowledge that I have today if God did not allow me to, to obtain wisdom and knowledge through my experience. So you have to give the glory to God. When is God important enough to receive the credit in your life? 
when are you going to make him important enough to receive the credit in your life? So the difference between God cleansing you and you staying the same is if you give into arrogance, pride, and have overconfidence. You, you're either going to allow God to cleanse you internally by, through purification and sanctification because God wants to refine you spiritually. But if, you, if, you're, if you're not getting sanctified by God and getting purified, you're not going to be spiritually refined. That's the process. You get purified, sanctified, and then spiritually refined. And see the purification, God going to be showing you all these different things that you need to change in your life. Internally, internal thoughts that are in disobedience of God or disobedience of God. You, you're going to have to internally change these things. And submit your will to God. So I hope y'all hearing me because it's so quiet. It's a lot of people in here tonight. And I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, speaking on what God has led me to speak on. Okay. So if you have any questions, please ask me so that we can talk about it and gain any clarification that we need. And please let me know if I'm too loud or not. I have two different sounds on. I have the... Um, my uh audio phone condenser and then i'm using a cell phone i'm on youtube and i'm kind of doing a lot of different things right now and i just want to make sure that i'm sounding right and hopefully you all can hear me correctly okay because this is the first time i've ever attempted to be online visually and in the podcast and using this audio phone and my phone and the, the youtube so it's kind of a lot right now. And I, I just I am allowing God to lead me in this discussion. So I just want to make sure that you all can hear me good. And um, you know, if you have any questions, please interject and let me know. Okay, so we can discuss what we need to. So the things that my uh pastor had discussed now, these were very, very interesting to me. Okay, so the consumer has a consumer mentality. Now, remember, all of these different things that I'm about to go over with you all, the individual have a mentality for this. This is in their mentality. Like some people have poverty mentalities or some people have rich minds, rich mentalities. They have uh, great content. They are very... uh, generous they they just have a generous type of personality which is uh you know their philanthropy they 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 are great givers you know you when you identify the mentality you can identify the areas that you need to work on okay so we're going to go over consumer now a consumer will never meet expectations now i really like this part Because when you identify a person that make excuses now, so like, let let me just explain this because I had a very thorough conversation about this, okay? And it was about, uh, well, how do you know if a person is making an, an excuse or something that is just out of their control? Well, this is quite obvious. So if you are every single day, and this is how you identify an excuse, okay? So an excuse is an extension of a lie that prohibits you from being successful in your relationship with God. So what you have to do is say, okay, is there an alternative? If there is an alternative, 
that means that you're making an excuse. So let me explain and dive deeper. If you say, well, see, I can't go to that job interview because I don't have any gas. Well, okay. Is there another alternative to getting gas? Have you made all of the necessary calls that you can make to maybe borrow some money? If you could borrow money for your phone bill and for your, your addiction, you should be able to borrow some money for something to get you some productivity done in your life. So, Because we, we, we without excuses. You don't make excuses because guess what? People that make excuses do not meet expectations. And it's not that, you know, uh, another person has these expectations. Yes, I can see you being great every day of your life. I can see the greatness in you. But if you don't see the greatness in yourself, then you're defeated. If you haven't exhausted every single possibility of making your goals work with God, then you're making an excuse. What's the alternative? Do you have an alternative? Are you just focusing on what you can't do? Because see, when I hear that, I was like, I, I can't do that. Uh-uh, see, I can't work that type of job. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't. What can you do? Because I've heard everything that you can't do. But what can't, what's within your means? So I was at, I was at the grocery store. And this lady, well, it's not really the grocery. I was at the Walgreens and I was getting like deodorant because their deodorant is really cheap at Walgreens. Okay. And I had a bunch of them up there. I'm like, this is a reward. I, and, and so I was so happy, ecstatic about being able to get this deodorant for so cheap. It's actually called, um, it's called native deodorant. And so this deodorant is like $15 and the, the, they were on sale for like $4, right? And so I was excited. I was ecstatic about it. But then when I got to the register, the, the young lady, she was like, well, it's ringing up for $14 and something. And I say, well, it's on sale $4. But to make a, a long story short, I had to say, okay, well, what is within your means to verify this price? If I can't go back there and verify the price, what, what can you do to get this price verified? See, because too many times we are focusing on things that are not within your means. But if it's within, what can you do? Now that is within your means. Why are you focus on things outside of your means? You have to first utilize what you have until God puts you where you need to be. Because otherwise, you, you're not going to meet expectations if you have a consumer mentality. So, that Consumer does not meet expectations. They make excuses. Seriously, this this here is the pastor was was right on with this. The Holy Spirit is working in the minds of his children in the church, the body. I'm telling you right now, God is working. So the a consumer is somebody that's not going to be able to meet expectations. They're going to make excuses. They're going to have a bad attitude. They're going to always talk about, oh well, see, I can't do that. I can't go over there right now. See, I'm busy right now. I can't do that. I don't know when I'll be able to do it. See, they're they're problematic. They don't, they're not, they're not focused on solution-driven approaches. They all they just always focusing on negativity. Well, well, how you think you're gonna make that appointment, girl? You got five minutes to get there. Uh well, I'm gonna go. 
and I'm going to let them turn me around. See, you have to understand that you, you have to be the type of person that's persistent for yourself because God wants you to be persistent. If the place is closing, nothing beats a failure but a try. Come on, let's go see if we make it up there. It's about your thinking, your mentality, how you how you are carrying things, seriously. So th this person, a consumer, has a bad attitude. Now, others walk on eggshells around them. Now, I know that this is probably true for me. Okay, now, um, <laughs> because sometimes people are like, they're like, when they talking to me, they nervous. And I'm, I'm like a really laid back type of person, but I, I'm, I'm outspoken, you know, but I do find myself sometimes when people are talking to me, like I can hear it in their voice, like they nervous. Um, some people are fidgety. Uh, I don't, maybe it's just my demeanor. I don't know. But sometimes people are working on eggshells with me. And I, I, at least I can admit, I know the areas where I need to do better. So, I mean, I try to make other people as comfortable as possible, you know. But my level of communication is, I communicate. And if you, you come from a place where there's a lack of communication, you come around me, you we're going to communicate. So let me just, I'm going to give you this as an analogy. Time is going back really fast, too. Um, so women that are raised by males have a different type of attitude than women that are raised without a male role model. And I cannot confirm this through generalizing, right? So the only way to generalize something is to make sure that you have a large number of statistics that you can refer back to, and then you can incorporate into a study. And now you can generalize because now you don't just have one or two people that you can analyze. But I'm going to say based upon my experience, Women that have a male role model act and think differently than women that did not have a male role model growing up. And I would say this is because of my experience only. Now, it could be some statistics out there. I don't know if they are or not. I'm not going to give you misinformation. What I am going to tell you is this. Communication is the key to all of it. If you are able to communicate with God, you're going to be able to communicate with every, everyone else around you. And when you have strong male role models around you, you are going to be a very strong female, strong woman. Because you see the men who submit to God, then women follow suit in order because they are influenced by those type of men. We as women are supposed to encourage and uplift the male figures in our life. Because that's all that they really need is, is that encouragement that God gives us. God is God has created us to be a helper, to encourage, to be able to communicate, to re reassure, reaffirm things. God, God gives us the wisdom and knowledge to be able to analyze and discern. So when you know your position, then you follow suit. So when we read the word of God and it says the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God, we identify and we understand what that means. We're not battling uh, thoughts in our mind over that scripture because we fully understand that God put that scripture there for 
a leading mechanism to make sure that we are being led in the right direction. So consumers, they don't communicate well, right? They don't fulfill commitments. They have little to no effort. They don't get the job done. Okay, that's what it says. They don't get the job done. They, um, they are not used to, okay, so that, that goes with the contributor. Okay, so they also have subpar work. They, I don't even know what I wrote there. Oh, they, they make excuses, but I already put, I put excuses with does not meet expectations. They lack excellence. And it's always something going on. That's what he said. This is specifically what the past said. But I've always said that people, people that make excuses, they, they got a whole lot going on and a whole lot of nothing going on. Okay. Because usually when you're making an excuse, you're not accomplishing anything. You're just focusing on the problematic things of what you can do, how you're not going to do it, what's preventing you from doing it. And all of the people that have contributed to you not being able to do it. <laughs> so that is what a person does in making an excuse. So let me repeat that again. Slow down a little. Let me slow down a little bit. A person that makes an excuse are going to have every reason why they can't do something. The reason, all the reasons why they're prevented from doing it. All the reasons why... Other people have caused them not to do it. And every single situation that led up to them not being able to do it. That's all that they can focus on. That's what people that make excuses do. So you know, they they probably could talk for a very long time and focus on all of the 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 can'ts and the reasons why it couldn't versus solution driven approaches as to what steps they can take now what solutions they see in their situation they're focusing on the latter so they're going to focus on all of these other negative things um that is going to prevent them from being a contributor or a catalyst type of person so they are also very inconsistent with life they are a complainer they have i love this part here he said they have entry level thinking. Entry level thinkers. They always talk about leadership. But when you're in leadership, you don't have to talk about leaders because you're a leader already. Like if I'm if I'm a boss, I'm not gonna go around saying I'm a boss. If I am thorough and I'm very analytic, I don't have to go around saying I'm thorough, I'm thorough, I'm analytic. Yeah, I observe everything. I don't have to do that. Why would I need to do that? You are supposed to. Uh, now, this is when I believe uh, sometimes I get this mixed up the scribe and about identity, but you are supposed to allow the perception of what other people say that you are when it comes to leadership. See, because I literally, I've had several people tell me, one of my closest friends, this is what he said. He said, there is no way anyone can be around you ever without doing good. That's just how inspiring you are in other people's life. So if they're not doing good around you, Cyrus, it's because they don't want to. Because sometimes I have felt bad. I was like, you know, I don't understand why, why don't she want to do something with her life? I don't understand. But then it's like, I do understand. It's like, I'm not just accepting what the truth is. See, God said that there are people who are going to be submitting their will. They are evil. They are, they don't care. They have characteristics of evil behavior. And these characteristics are preventing them from prevailing in their relationship and their walk with God. So you think God was inconsistent? Absolutely not. You think God made excuses? Oh, see, we can't go to the next town because my feet hurt. 
Did, did he say that? Absolutely not. See, I can't I can't hear the sick because the, the religious Pharisees calling him possessed. Jesus didn't say that. He still did what he had to do. So if you have all of these traits, you have to internally recognize the things that you are doing that is preventing you that preventing you from having a strong relationship with God. So don't be an entry level thinker. They always talk about leadership because if you're a leader, you you don't really got to talk about it. People know you. Your name rings. People, they they know who you are. Even if you're in another town or you at a new job, people are going to see the good in you. It can't be blemished or blotted out. It just comes out of you. So they will know, oh, you know, she don't play no games, but she will help you do some stuff. Or, you know, he is so focused. He he going to make it happen. He, he a real leader. So you have to understand it. Don't be an entry-level thinker. Always, they always talk about leadership. So now we're going to talk about the contributor. So a contributor, they are someone who get the job done. They accept constructive criticism. Uh, a contributor, they have uncomfortable conversations. Now, remember when I was saying <laughs> I have uncomfortable conversations with people. Sometimes I ask uncomfortable questions. Like when I ask, well, what do you think about the word white nigger or the word orange nigger or just the word nigger altogether? What do you think about the U.S. Supreme Court uh just the u.s supreme court justices taking medications that's impairing their ability to have a clear and sound sound mind those are conversations that make people uncomfortable so they they usually will avoid them they will avoid them at all costs but when you are a contributor you are going to have uncomfortable conversations even if they are negative because you can identify the negativity in that conversation and then provide a solution. Because God will be, be leading you to providing a solution. So usually when people avoid things, they're, they're not being a contributor. You can't avoid anything, right? Avoid con a conversation that could potentially lead to you growing in life. Or you you having a conversation, oh well, you know, those black people, they always got their hand out. They always begging. They just think everybody owes them something. You know, and then you had the the, the some other people who have negative perception. Oh God, the black people are always in jail. They got making up all the crime. Why is that? It's the same jobs being afforded to them. You have racial de facto segregation, which is residential segregation in education, academic institutions. So because one student is living at this address and this zip code, they can't go to the school over there. So now they're going to a school that is not diverse. Then you have media outlets using the term diverse when they should, in fact, call it separate and unequal. So media is negatively influencing the minds of people. And now you're limiting the ed education in certain minority communities. There is articles, lots of articles on the correlation of crime and education. Once again, that is the correlation of crime and education. There is no correlation with those. Because it shows that people that are more educated are less likely to commit crime. So if you remove the education component from marginalized communities, what are you doing to them? What are you causing that community to have? Or is it your goal to have a community that's with, filled with um, crime? Because if you have poverty and crime, 
that means it's some residual income for some some of those in power, is it? They ain't have any perks to keep people in poverty. There's a lot of funding being distributed, distributed to uh, Congress and cities and states. But are these funds really being accounted for? Or is there misappropriation of funds in these marginalized communities? So someone needs to be accountable. So we, when you are a contributor, you are able to have uncomfortable conversations, even if they are negative. You are going to get the job done. You accept constructive criticism. You are competent. You add value. You add value to the conversation. You add value to the lives of other people. You try to add value to your community. You fulfill expectations. You tithe and, uh, and give offering. You, you can be trusted because you're credible. Right? You're not sitting here having a, a podcast channel or a YouTube video and saying that, well, this community is so diverse when in fact that community is separate and unequal. Call it for what it is. It's not diverse. So if you look at you look at a term and you say diverse, that will be interpreted by the masses differently than if you were to use the same word and call it separate and unequal. So instead of saying separate and unequal, you're saying diverse. Deception. So we're going to call it for what it is. We have uncomfortable conversations. Okay. We're credible because we're going to provide accurate information. So now a contributor, that's what a contributor are. So a catalyst, a catalyst is someone who has great something great i i guess i um i, I just kind of scribbled the word now i apologize so it is uh someone who exceeds expectations you don't just you don't just have uh you don't just meet expectations you over exceed expectations so like you the type of person that when you get a job, you're going to go in, they're going to lay out your job description, and you're going to over exceed those goals. So if you got a sales position, and, and, the, and the quota is to make 100 sales a week, now you're gonna, your goal is to make 200 or 250, 250 sales. You, so when you're a catalyst, you're going to greatly exceed expectations. All right? You're going you're gonna to contribute new ideas. You're innovative. You're going to go the extra mile. You're an asset and not a liability. You empower your team. So there is no bottleneck if you do it by yourself. Character will keep you there. You dominate. You're not embarrassed to dominate. You delegate. You're optimistic. You're flexible. So all of these things here is someone that are that is a catalyst. And I really like it because you're able to contribute new ideologies. You're innovative. You are not a liability in the person's life, meaning that you're not just withdrawing, withdrawing, withdrawing from their life. You're actually contributing and you're making, um, you adding value to them in their life. You are, you are empowering them. Because God, as God empowers you, you also empower others. Okay, so now the difference between, um, I think, did I read this? I'm not sure. So the difference between purification and sanctification is that purify is to cleanse something or to rid it of impurities while sanctify is to make you holy. So you want to consecrate, I did read this. So you want to consecrate yourself and set, uh, set yourself apart for the things that is important to God. So God wants to spiritually refine us. So to be spiritually refined, we need to think about others and not always think about ourselves or our needs and desires. You want to be freer from always feeling the need to be concerned about your own needs and desires. 
You want to meditate and devote and, and devote yourself on God refining you. Because God wants you to be purified, sanctified, and spiritually refined. So in Mark uh, 4.19, it says, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and then becoming unfruitful. So as I had mentioned earlier, God does not see us as full of impurity, but full of potential to be purified, sanctified, and spiritually refined. Just because God sees us with potential, it does not mean that he is going to always snap his fingers and get rid of all the problems in your life. So you have to understand that you have to build your relationship with God. No one else can build your relationship with God besides you. You are the one that builds the relationship with God. So we can pray for you every single day. But when you're making choices, you are making those choices. You are making those decisions. You want to establish and maintain a relationship with God. And when you do that, God will remove the impurities in your life. This will also allow you to be purified by removing all the unclean things that have caused you to be impure. So some solutions that will allow you to overcome habits that make you un impure. Well, you can start waking up early. You know, um, set, set the tone. Basically, that's what you're doing. You're setting the tone for yourself. So if... If I get up at just say 10 or 11, now I want to take initiative and do create a new habit for myself. So I'm going to set the tone by getting up at 6 or 7 in the morning. So you basically, you're for forcing your flesh to do things that your flesh isn't accustomed to doing. If you already wake up early, then wake up maybe an hour or two earlier than what you normally would. So you dominate. You dominate your flesh through the spirit of God. You can also write and journal. So expressing yourself um, on paper will help allow you to read some of the anxieties and depression that you feel. Because journaling, journaling will help you express yourself. And when you are writing, make sure that you're looking at the scripture and you're accompanying the word of God to what you want God to deliver in your life, what you want God to give you. Because it's one thing for you to talk about the problems that's going on in your life, but it's another thing when you say, okay, God, this is what you this is what I've experienced, and this is the way I would like for it to be. And so now you, you create potential um, solutions and you give it to God and you pray about it. I, I know I keep saying you do this with God and you do that with God and you do this with God. But really, when it becomes a part of your normal practice and behavior, God is just automatic. It's not something that you just be like, oh, well, this is hard or something like that. It's not. OK, it's it's automatic. It becomes a part of your daily routine, your daily practice. This is who you are now. This is not something that you just cover up. If people if people say that they know you, they should be able to know what's your favorite praise and worship song. They, they in your circle of friends. They should know what's your favorite praise and worship song. Or they should at least know your favorite scripture. If they don't, and you have made God a part of your life, then something is missing. It's just like if you were my close circle of friends, you know my kids' names. If you're not, you're not going to know that. 
And that's the truth. So, you you know, you want to make sure that people, um, they identify with, you know, the change in you. So others are going to be able to see the change in you and it's going to help you change. Another thing is you don't have permission to judge others. Say a prayer if you see a flaw. If you see it and God, God show you, pray about it. You intervene on things. That's intervention. You intervene when you see something. You do that through prayer and accompanied by works. Faith is accompanied by works. Faith without works is dead. That's what it says. So you, you implement your faith is ignited and directly correlated with your work. So you're intervening. The prayer is an act, which is your works. And remember, you do not have permission to judge others. Just say a prayer if you see a flaw in them. You'll get in the habit of praying for people just because you just got out of a lift and the lady was upset. So now you're in the house praying for her. Oh, Lord, God, help her. Give her peace that surpasses all understanding. Whatever is in her life preventing her from having peace, God, remove it from her life. That lady don't even know you in there praying for her. But this is just a part of your life because now, see, you didn't call your friends on the phone and say, girl, I just got out of this lift. And this girl had an attitude. She was doing this. She was doing that. Instead, you didn't even make no phone call. What you did was you took it to the throne and you and you and you prayed for her. That's what you did. You talked to God about her. You have to tell God on people. I tell God. I'm telling you. I say, God. You know, this was that wasn't right, Lord. And God will talk back to you. So allow God to talk back to you. Tell God what you, what's going on in your heart. Because you don't have the permission to judge others. Just say a prayer if you see something or a flaw in others. You want to uh, maintain accountability. Now, this is really important. I went over accountability the other day. So let me just go ahead and reiterate the importance of being accountable. You cannot have conviction in your heart. If you don't allow yourself to be accountable. So people that are lack in accountability will also lack in their spiritual growth with God. Because they, as they, as they reject accountability in their life, they also going to reject being convicted for anything. If you have convict, if you allow conviction to come into your heart to change you. That means that everything that you've been disobedient with God about, God is going to convict you. And you're going to accept that conviction. And you're going to change it. Repent means to turn away. So you, you, you repent, then you turn away from it. Because guess what? You are a person that can easily gravitate to being accountable. But when you are a person that says, oh, no, our country isn't. Found on the basis of being an oppressor. When the entire world looks at the United States as being an oppressor. Other countries. But you now are lacking in accountability and saying, well, we don't need the critical race theory in schools. Because, see, when, when these African-American students are learning civil rights leadership, they're going against America. And America shouldn't be viewed as an oppressor. Well, if America shouldn't be viewed as an oppressor, well, why is America continuing to do oppressive things to people? And I love the country that I live in. My family was, I have a lot of people in my family that are veterans. And that's another issue. You think about the veterans and you go up to the uh, VA 
And you ask any of the veterans how how do they feel that their their country have treated them since they were in active duty. And you see, just get the answers of the VA. Go to the VA yourself. So you have veterans who have been subjected to all sorts of things. You have people that are disabled that do not make excuses for anything. You have disabled veterans that still, even despite receiving assistance from the government, still don't receive anything and still make a way for themselves. So you can't lack accountability. You have to identify the problem and then you create conflict resolution. The next thing is important for us to be able to wait on God. When God tells you to do something, just continue doing it. Continue to do what God says. If you don't hear the voice of the Lord, wait. That means that God is, is training you up to have patience. Because see, when you're anxious about something, you're going to move real quick without thinking. You're not going to have that discernment like you need to. So God wants you to wait. See, remember when God says to honor your mother and your father? Because when you honor your mother and father, it shows how much you can wait on them to do some things. They may not take you shopping, right, when you want to go shopping. They may not be able to buy this or that for you, right? But they are there for you. It's the same way in your relationship with God. God may not show up when you want him to, but he's going to show up for you. So honoring your parents allows you the ability to show what type of relationship that you will have with God in the future. Wait on God. It teaches you patience and perseverance. So perseverance is patience. So it teaches you ultimately patience. So if you are having any other major concerns and you need to talk to someone, go talk to a counselor. So many times there you have these negative preconceived um, notions that, oh, uh, I'm not going to see a counselor. I went to premarital counseling. And it was so interesting because it, it just, I learned a lot just from going to premarital counseling. I knew that I was unequally yoked. But yet and still, I still was married. I still got married, even with going to premarital counseling. So God will show us things through other people. And you have to be able to seek the help that you need. You may be thinking like, oh, your life is just like, this is this is it. This is the end. It's so many problems. It's no resolutions for this. No one can help. But guess what? You go see a counselor. God put that counselor in your life to give you some solutions. Because, see, sometimes people out on the outside looking in can see things that you may not even be able to see for yourself. You may be thinking, like, this is the worst situation ever. But really, in fact, it's, it's just a stepping stone, stone for you to have something better. So you want to be, you, you want to be active. What, what do you call it? You want to be um, proactive in your search to build a strong relationship with, with God and the communication that you have with God. Because when you have a, a good communication with God, you also have better communication with people. You assume the best. You have discernment to evaluate situations. You don't want to sit there and think, oh, well, see, if you do that, then that's, this is not going to be able to do that. Because, see, everything is going to fail. So everything isn't going to fail. You assume the best. You assume that that person is going to do what they say they're going to do. That yes is yes and they know it's no. 
You're going to be able to invest in something of good, great people who really want to uh, obtain delegated work and perfect it to the point where they're going to make sure that your organization and your company is thriving. So you want to assume the best. Quit assuming the bed all the time. You want to speak biblical affirmations. You don't need the affirmations of other people. You don't need anyone to validate you. I don't need anyone to validate the woman, the child, or God, or the, or the child of God that I am. I am a child of God. I don't need anyone to validate anything. I don't need the validation. God gives me the validation. I don't need your affirmation. You could go on on the guessing spree all you want, because but when you have discernment, you're not going to need to go on the guessing spree because God gives you information and your validation coming from God. So you want to you want to speak biblical affirmations. You don't need to be speaking all them affirmations that somebody else can say about this person and that person. Who cares about what they said? You are not what they said you are. You what God said you are. So you're more than a conqueror. Profess it and confess it. Live it. So what I noticed is sometimes like with my kids, it, it, it has been difficult at times for me to say, okay, well, this is what I see you're doing. And so this isn't, this is this is something that you need to improve on, or maybe you should stop doing this and stop doing that, right? And it's like as a parent, I don't want to continue to speak the negative, but at the same time, we have to address issues. So now I'm not just talking at you. We're talking together, and now we can pray together. So now let me let me get actively involved in what's going on with this situation. It ain't about me just speaking about it. It's I, I need to be actively involved. To make sure that I'm encouraging and inspiring in, in the way that I'm supposed to. Because if you could do that in a relationship, you should be able to do that for your kids. You could support this man or you could support that woman. You should be able to also support your children to the maximum ability of they for potential see i will support this cousin this uncle this person but when it comes to my my kids i'm going to give them the fullest support you need to use the car go ahead you need to do this go ahead you need a plane ticket all right i got you you, you need a, a cosign on that. I got you. Okay, you're going to make sure you pay it. We got a plan. We created a smart goal. Okay, I'm there. Because, see, your kids is a blessing that the Lord has given you. And you have to see them as being a blessing. I've always seen my kids as a blessing to me. And I love my children. But when we get distracted... By being in a re wrong relationship that is not glorifying to God, that is unequally yoked, you bring in all these other inconsistencies that is not what God wants for us. That means you you doing things that is not of God. So you want to make sure that your affirmations come in biblical, biblical. I'm sorry, biblical affirmations. So you don't depend on the words of other people to validate who you are because you know who you are in Christ and you know that you are a child of God. And you also want to understand that failure is not a permanent condition. It is temporal. Don't recycle mediocre mistakes. Evaluate yourself. Identify areas that you could have improved and made a better decision. Evaluate you, self self evaluate you, not from the lens of your perspective or understanding, but from the lens and perspective of God. 
because when you have that self scrutiny in a way to your own understanding, it's gonna misguide you. So be be guided by the Holy Spirit to ask God and say, God, what are some things that I need to change in my life internally so that I won't make the same mistakes? Show me, God. Show me what I need to do now in my life to be obedient to you, to live a life of abundance. You want to be authentic because no one else can be you. So it's no reason for you to be motivated to be like anyone else. See, because the way she wear her shoes isn't going to be the same way that they look on me when I wear my shoes. So when I look in the mirror at the shoes that I have on, I'm, I'm look at them and I'm satisfied because that is something that I want to do, not because I was motivated to wear them because of someone else. You have the confidence that come from God because your motivation doesn't come through validation of other people. So you want to show equality. Showing equality is really important. You want to make sure that you are you are merciful to other people. In Genesis 3, 9, it says, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Remember that God pursues you, even when you are all caught up in your habits and your own self wants and needs. See, because the, when Adam and Eve sinned, they, the fall of man, God said, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Even when you caught up in your habits and needs. See, God, this is what God reveals to me. If God is omnipresent, God is everywhere all at the same time, all at once. That means God is present when something bad going on. God is present when something good going on. God is present when the sin is happening. But God is allowing you to choose. Because he said, I will never leave you. That's what he said. I will never leave you. I will never leave you or forsake you. So you have to know that God loves you and wants to purify, sanctify, and spiritually refine you. So now um, let me go through this scripture. I had went through this scripture yesterday when I talked about, because uh, when I talked about being um, little like the little children. So I'm going to go to uh, verse six. So Matthew 18, verse six. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drawn in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. See, God is saying right here that don't cause other people to stumble. When people are around you, they should be being prosperous. They should be good around you. Because that's that your encouragement and inspiration. It's shining all over to them. It's spilling all over to them. Your light is leaking into their life. So if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and throw it away. It is better for your eye. It, it said, oh, well, how am I reading this? It is better for... It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Now, I, I, I know that some people per, uh, perceive this as physical. But when you have a, a, a great spiritual eye for things, you, you aren't going to be um, stumbling or lusting over the things of this world. So it would be no reason for you to gouge your eye out. So when you have spiritual life through God, these things aren't going, that is not going to apply to you because your hand or your foot is not going to cause somebody else to stumble. 
because this, the light of God that's in you is going to shine and leak into the lives of everyone else around you. And so let me just read this last scripture, um, this last verse, and then you all could read the, the one starting from verse 21. It says, if your brother or sister, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah, I'm going to read verse 10. So, uh, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angel in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly, I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. So in the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So you have to understand that when, when God's children fall astray, they're like that one little lost sheep that God wants to bring back, you know. So God is not, the healthy people don't need a doctor, but the sick people do. And what I mean by sick, it, it means spiritually sick, mentally sick. People are spiritually dead. So we have to, as children of God in the body of Christ, we have to work with them and help people. And that means that our, our light that's in us, the God that is in us, the Holy Spirit that is in us should be leaking off into the light in their life, enhancing their lives. Okay. So let me go ahead and pray because this, this podcast ends in two hours. So. All right. Um, Father God, thank you so much for being able to lead me in this conversation. Thank you so much for all the people that were listening. God, allow us all to retain the information, God. Please continue to give us discernment. Eliminate and remove all of the habits that are in our life that is or have prevented us from walking in your purpose and your plan in our life, God. Take everything out of us, every single thing from the root, God. Remove it from our hearts and our lives, God, and replace it with everything that pleases you. God, let your spirit, your Holy Spirit of conviction fall upon us for anything that we do in our life that displeases you, God, because we want to live a life that is of abundance, Lord, and we want to be obedient and we want to do things that pleases you, God. So we ask that you just continue to lead us through your paths of righteousness and you allow your will to be done, not our will. Continue to inspire and encourage our decisions, our our uh, choices, including influencing our habits, God. And we pray this in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. It is still in your blood. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for joining me. Please remember to share, share, share. And um, you all, I will see you on Thursday. And remember, uh, the YouTube uh, video is uploaded and you could also access other um, media outlets. Please share, share, share. Thank you so much. You all have a good night.